welcome friends to this second half of today's event i want to talk about some practical things that are associated we with being on the spiritual path and these are again questions which have been sent to me by emails over and over again so i thought i'll deal with them right here first thing is what is food and diet to do with meditation if meditation is merely discovering yourself within yourself what is the importance of vegetarian food or not eating eggs or not eating meat to do with it this is a question that is being asked over and over again from me that why should diet have anything to do with it are we not making it a religion by prescribing particular kind of diet whereas on the one hand i am saying don't make it religion don't make it series of just ritual ceremonies and then i am saying well it's better to have a vegetarian diet is it not is it not a contradiction the answer is that any food we take has an impact our on our power to concentrate our attention we are built like that in this world life subsists on life no form of life is living on inanimate things nobody is living by eating stones and eating dust they all living on living things you look at the whole of nature even animals fish fowl all living on living things therefore it appears that while we are in the physical world we only survive by making other living things our food now even vegetables are living things because plant life is a life with life with soul same soul we have every plant has the same soul so we are actually extinguishing life every time we eat any kind of food and whether they are big fish eating the small fish or the big animals eating big smaller animals or eating you know, leaves from trees everybody is feeding itself from other forms of life when we extinguish life to make it our food it impacts our ability to concentrate our attention think of it like this if you are reading a book you put your concentration on reading the book it takes time to read depending upon your speed of reading supposing your average speed of reading an average fiction book is a minute a page you take 1 minute to read a page then go and kill somebody and come back and try to read the same page you won't be able to read it it'll take you a long time for that event which has impacted your subconscious to get back to the power where you can put your attention back again your power to concentrate your attention is affected by the fact you extinguish life elsewhere it may take days for you to recover the same rate of speeding the book speed reading the book that you were doing before supposing you kill an animal you kill a dog or kill a cat and come back you can measure that your ability to read the page same page of book will be diminished it'll take longer to concentrate your attention no matter what type of life you extinguish it affects your power to concentrate your attention even when you eat a vegetable or an apple it affects your power to concentrate but since the degree of life based upon the state of awareness of that living thing varies the more aware they are the more impact it has on you therefore you kill a man your power to concentrate your attention is affected more than if you kill to kill an animal as that is more if you kill something of a lower order of life the order of life is based upon what awareness we can see in these life forms of course not all life forms have the same awareness in the indian description of life forms they divided the life forms into how many predominant elements they had they counted five elements and they represented with earth water air fire and ether these represented actually solids liquids gaseous heat or the ability to discriminate sense these five elements are present 
in most of the living forms in varying degrees. In some forms, like plants, the predominant element is only one, water. In some forms of life, the snakes and so on, the predominant form is solid. And in some forms, it is heat, sometimes it is not. Each one has different forms, some a combination of one, two, three, or four of these different elements. A human being has all five elements complete. Therefore, in their classification of different species of life forms, they've gone by these elements. And very roughly speaking, it represents the degree of awareness we can observe in these life forms. How aware they are, how much they are affected by awareness, how much experience they're having in awareness. So that is why, by extinguishing life, even if you have not extinguished life, but the food that you're eating has resulted from extinguishing life, that impacts your ability to concentrate your attention. So it's a very practical measure for which I am recommending that you have simple vegetarian food. It helps you in your meditation. I had the opportunity when I was Deputy Commissioner of Dharamsala, Kangara district in India, to welcome His Holiness Dalai Lama, who had to run away from Tibet because of the Chinese attack there. And I was required to host him, so I received him there. And I found that he was not a vegetarian. He was meditating eight hours a day. And I asked him, doesn't the food that he eat affect him? And he argued with me. He said, what has food to do with meditation? I have two senior tutors. They also eat meat. I also eat. The Buddhists have started eating meat. In the beginning, I said, Buddha never ate meat, but you follow Buddha. He said, yes, those days were different. Now things have changed. I said, I tried to convince him on the very argument I'm suggesting to you. But he was not convinced. Then I gave him the final test. You try meditation for one month with vegetarian food and one month with your regular non-vegetarian food. And tell me if there's a difference. After one month, he became vegetarian. And he found that such a big difference. And we discussed it. He was in Zurich in a hospital. They force fed him with some meat substitute, meat soup, meat soup actually, not substitute. And he came back and met me in Chandigarh and told me that they had force fed him this and it affects his meditation. So even force feeding by somebody else affected him because the food impacts our ability to meditate. And that's why I suggest that connection between food is not the connection between our going to our true home. It's a connection with our ability to meditate properly and to locate ourselves with the power of concentration of attention behind the eye center. I also want to mention that it's not merely good to be vegetarian. Just by becoming vegetarian, you don't become spiritual. I see vegetarians having the same anger, same lust, same greed, sometimes worse than non-vegetarians. The food does not change everything. But the food is certainly helpful in meditation, in the power of concentration of attention. Also, if you eat too much, it also has a bad effect. If you eat too much, but you say we are vegetarians, it will also come in the way of your meditation. So not merely a question of what you eat. Eat light. It sits on you nicely, makes you healthy, and makes you better equipped for meditation. And that is why I say not only vegetarian food, take light, small quantities of vegetarian food. And I have said many times, if we all ate half of what we're eating, even one third of what we're eating, we'd be more healthy. We overeat. And I found from research that it takes 20 minutes for the stomach to tell the brain, I am full. And those are the 20 minutes we keep on eating. And we are overfilled. By the time we get the message we are full, we are already overfilled. So that is why when you feel you are still hungry, leave it at that and you will be absolutely okay. After 20 minutes, you'll find you are full. So th these are just things that you take light, simple food, simple vegetarian food, and your meditation will be better. It's just a tip like that. The second tip is, 
that if you lead a life that is based upon relationship to other people, which always is, you have your wife, your spouses, your children, and you lead a life of con constant conflict and anger, fighting with each other, then you say we are meditating. How can you meditate in those circumstances? It is necessary to have a peaceful life around you in order to meditate better. So all these things impact. It's not a question of food only. It's a question of your way of life. So if if you are in a constant struggle, constant fight, constant trouble with people around you, you can't meditate properly. You know, well, I've seen people. I was staying with a family. They were always having a dispute. The man would shout and say, Damn it, I don't care for you. I'm going to meditate now. So I didn't know what kind of meditation that was. So when you are... Your anger, what, what does anger do to us? Imagine this. Anger scatters our attention even more. And you can see it. If you have visual, make a visual image of anger, and you're getting angry, you see it going like this. It's actually spreading out from you. And you can't collect it together for quite a while. So that is why if your life is not peaceful, now, that's a whole big subject, how to make life peaceful. To say, I am meditating against all odds is no use. You can't meditate against all odds because you won't be meditating. You'll be thinking about those odds. So that is why it is necessary to deal with these things, your environment around yourself in a different way and to see that there's a great advantage on it. They say... Speech is silver, but silence is golden. Sometimes running away is diamond. When you have problems, very often we exaggerate and increase those problems by trying to speak more. If we speak less, it is sometimes better. A holy man once came here and I heard his talk. A young lady got up and said, to that holy man, Master, I have a problem. My husband and I are constantly fighting. Can you find a solution for that? He said, yes, I have a solution. He said a similar case happened in India to another holy man. So I'm going to tell you the same solution that worked there. A woman complained to the holy man, India, my husband and I, we fight all the time. Any solution? He said, yes. Bring a bottle of water and I'll bless it. It'll help you. So she brought a bottle of water and the holy man blessed with some mantra on it and said, now take it. She said, how often should I give it to my husband? He said, not for your husband. It's for you. And the manner of taking it is, when your husband is arguing, you take one sip of this and hold in your mouth till he stops talking. <laughs> Then swallow it. If he starts talking again, take another sip and there will be peace in the house. So the method was very simple that very often by trying to argue back, we are exaggerating, increasing the tension and not solving it. Sometimes it is good not to respond because the response does not always solve a problem. Secondly, there's an art of smiling. If you smile, very often the matter disappears there. Sometimes you're criticized for smiling as something serious being discussed. <laughs> Smile more. <laughs> and it is impossible to carry on a fight when the other person keeps on smiling. So I read a book long ago by Dale Carnegie. The book was How to Win Friends and Influence People. I like the chapter on smiling. In that he says, smiling can solve a lot of problems. And even if you are not feeling like smiling, you should smile. Even if you have to pretend that you are smiling, even then do so, it helps you. And ultimately, a pretended smile turns out a real smile when you find the effect of it. So that is why, if you want to maintain a peaceful atmosphere, very often you have to just accept because you can't solve problems by more argument. And we've seen that in life. 
So to keep on arguing, to keep on arguing over the same thing. And people argue over things which have no significance in their life. Later on they'll think twice, what was I arguing about? What is the, what is the value of all that what we were discussing? It had no value at all. Just on some simple point. No, the book says this. No, I read it, it didn't say this. Okay, you keep on arguing and fight over it and get angry and don't speak to each other for two days. Who cares what the book says? It was not even an important book. Just because you pick up an argument. Then there's another thing, and that is we work outside in our workplaces. We go to office, we go to business, we have our jobs, and we get upset at the jobs. It always happens, we don't always get the right bosses. Some bosses are nasty to us, some partners are un, uh, unfair to us, and we have some disappointments in our life. What do we do? We can't say anything there, so we come home and fight there. We fight, and the spouse or the children are wondering what is the fight about. We don't tell them the fight was there actually in the office or in the business, and we're just taking it out at home. So somebody had told me a very interesting way to deal with it. They said that you should have a nice uh, pot of flowers and some plants in your bathroom. I said, what, how does that help? He says, when you get angry in the office or business place, come lock yourself in the bathroom and take all your anger out on those plants. Those plants uh, won't react and you will feel calm after that. The idea is to get these things off from your chest instead of taking it out on people who will react again like, like yourself without knowing what the reason for this is. So you just get it off your chest. This uh, business about plants, it's very interesting because plants have life. I remember coming to this country, and in my own country, one of the uh, scientists, Dr. Jagdish Chandra Bose, had demonstrated that plants have life and that they have consciousness in varying degrees. But here, one Dr. Baxter was doing similar experiments in California, but he was doing under the protection of the U.S. government. So I had to get a U.S. government permit to meet him, just to see what work he is doing. And he showed me in his lab the work he was doing with plants. He would put electrodes on them and he would trace their ECGs, EKGs, and discover that they reacted to emotions like human beings. One day, Dr. Baxter left the electrodes attached to a plant which was in the corner of his room and they did not take them off as he would normally do. And uh, the electrode and the machine recording his uh, EKG was already fixed up. Next morning he came, he found in the middle of the night at about 11.30 or so, according to the chart, there was great emotional reaction in the plant. So he was surprised. First he just made a mistake to leave those electrodes on, those connections on. So then he found out that a girl assistant who was there was molested by a man who was in the next lab at that very time. So the girl complained to him afterwards when he had seen those readings. She said that, that man came and did this. So he called that man and the electrode was still on. As soon as that man entered, the plant had the same reaction again. Imagine he told me it could, it's quite possible that these plants without eyes are seeing without having the sense organ that we have. They have a life force which reacts like any living things. So you will notice that plants have life, everything that, is, have a, that has a growth, that has this ability to multiply the cells, has a growth in it, is a living thing. And all living things have life. So when we Say we eat plants, we eat other food, we are always extinguishing some degree of life. So if you dec decrease the least amount, it's much better. The another tip I would like to give is that meditation, in order to gather your attention behind the eyes, is best done where a place is completely silent and dark. If you can find such a place in your house, it's useful. There was an American doctor, 
Dr. Julian Johnson. He went to India. He was initiated by the great master Baba Savan Singh. And he meditated. Then he found that the best place to meditate was where there was complete silence and complete darkness. And he saw some of the serious meditators digging little caves in the bluff of that river. So he went and made his own cave. And he meditated there and had much greater results. And in fact, he became a friend of mine. I was very young. He was much older. But we used to walk together to his cave. And sometimes he would let me use his cave. So I found that the sitting in the cave in complete darkness and with no light, nothing to do, not even having to close your eyes, not having to plug your ears, you could have the benefit of meditating there. So that was a great experience. Not only for him, also for me. So that's why if you can set up such a place, it's not always possible. I'm only suggesting if it is possible to set up a place in your own house, where it's all covered and you can have, like we used to have in old days, when there were no iPhones and automatic cameras, we used to have a dark room to develop a camera. It was completely dark. We used to have a little place like that if you were interested in photography. That was a great place to do meditation. So that helps a lot. Otherwise, you have to close your eyes, block the light outside. If there's still some light, it's a distraction. You will find a noticeable difference in meditation if you can do that. So these are some of the tips I'm sharing with you from my experience that if you have light food, light vegetarian food, not eat too much at the evening meal, and also meditation is really in two parts. Meditation is to gather your attention behind the eyes so that you can proceed on your spiritual path. And the second is to be pulled in by the love of the master. To gather your attention, you are doing repetition of words. Repetition of words helps us because it prevents other words to come into the mind. It's a very simple process. Don't make it more mysterious than it is. That oh, these are magical words, I'm going to repeat the words and I'll go to such Sajkhand. It's like that man, an American man who heard that a powerful mantra exists in India. If you repeat the mantra, you get enlightened. So he found out there's a man sitting up in the Himalayas, in the mountains, and he can give such a mantra, such magical words. If you repeat them, you go to enlightenment. So he traveled all the way to India, went up the Himalayas, trekked on foot to reach that little cave where the holy man was hiding inside that cave. He waited outside along with the disciples of that man. When the holy man came out, he said, I have come from the United States of America. I understand you have some holy words. If you repeat them, then you go get enlightened. He said, yes, I have those words. Will you give them to me? Yes, come close to me. So he went close to him and he whispered to him, the holy words are abracadabra. He says, have I come all this distance to hear abracadabra from you? He says, no, there's a catch to that. When you say abracadabra, don't think of bananas. <laughs> the man tried all his life. Every time he said abracadabra, bananas would be in front of him. The holy man had indicated to him that it's not a question of words. Words are association of ideas. You put another idea with those words, the words lose their meaning. He was able to put bananas into abracadabra. That is how our mind works. Our mind, by using any words, goes immediately to all the links with that word. After all, what are words? Words are merely sounds, phonetic symbols. What have, what have, how did we give meaning to these phonetic symbols? By association of ideas. A child is born and he's shown a toy and called a toy. Every time you say toy, he will associate the sound called toy with that particular toy. Later on, he'll see more toys of different kinds, and they're all called toys. His meaning of the word toy will expand to all toys. All of us have learned our languages like that. No matter what language it is, 
languages are nothing but phonetic symbols with association of ideas creating meanings for them. And therefore, when we use any word, what it means is it linked with all the association of ideas we have. So when we do repetition of words, if we repeat words which have meanings with all the things we know here, we remain here. No mantra is good if it refers to things that we are already associating right here. A good mantra by definition would be one where if we repeat, it has no meaning here. But if it has any meaning, it's got meaning in what we have heard about might be inside. That is why these perfect living masters, when they give you these words to repeat, they are conscious of this and they try to give you words which have association with something that will be there inside, but not known to you yet, but nothing outside. And although you say it will be there later, from their point of view, there is no will be. They have found the way where there is no time and space. They found where all time is one moment. And therefore, when they give the mantra, at that time, it is not that you will experience, you have experienced. You, on the other hand, are living in time and space, and therefore you in due course come and see that. But once you reach their state, you will find all things can be experienced at the same time. So that is why a mantra given by a perfect living master is given with associations, with experiences that occur inside and are there right now. But we don't see them, we see them in time. But they are there right now. That is the association of ideas of words. But merely repeating words, parrot-like, and thinking of other things has no value. If the mind does not repeat the words, it is no value. Chanting with the mouth, chanting with your tongue, and thinking of other things has no value at all in the spiritual path. Therefore, your mind should be involved in repeating that. Now, it's very difficult to involve the mind in repeating words. A, a thing that we miss in the beginning when we try to repeat words, the tongue moves along with the mind trying to repeat. That's okay. Because we're used to speaking with the tongue. And therefore, the tongue moves gradually when you're able to hear that the mind is saying other things and tongue is not moving. How come the mind can think other things without your tongue moving when you try to speak the word that you want the mind to speak? The tongue moves with it. So you'll notice that the mind has its own way of talking. And gradually you move from talking with the tongue to moving and saying the words with your mind. But the mind can say words in many channels. Something that I discussed with Dalai Lama also. That when you are repeating, because he was repeating the traditional Tibetan mantra, Om Mani Padme Ho. So by repeating those words, he was also thinking of other things. And he found out that he can be repeating the words at the same time the mind is thinking on top of it. At the very same time, you repeat the words and the mind also keeps on talking to you. Are you doing it too slow? This was fast. This is not the way to do it. Who is that speaking? The same mind. Therefore, to make the repetition of words effective, it is very necessary to not let the mind say anything else in any other voice. Mind has many voices. You can, if you're a serious meditator, you must have heard that the mind has many voices. You have to meditate in every voice that the mind speaks. Mind can bring pictures of other people inside just to distract you. Then instead of fighting it, you should allow other people to join you and in a chorus, 10 people, 20 people sitting in your head all saying the same thing at the same time. That's effective repetition of words. So merely repeating words, thinking it's a duty, I have to do my meditation two and a half hours and I keep on repeating and my mind is somewhere else, has no value at all. It's a waste of two and a half hours. But if you can do it with the mind and hold it there, you have gathered your attention. You will become unaware of your body. Gradually, but definitely, you become unaware of your body and become much more aware of the body inside that is repeating the words. You'll be aware of the mind and inner body that's working independently of this physical body. It's an exercise. It's an exercise that you can do. 
it's not an exercise that will take you to your true home. It will take you on the way to your true home. It will take you to the railroad station from where the train you have to pick up along with your master to go home. It's the, it's the way to reach the airport where your master is waiting with the airline tickets to fly home. It's like that experience. So it's, it's important to do these things not as a ritual, but as an effective means of gathering attention behind the eyes at the third eye center and experiencing it. Finally, I would like to say that the mind has a habit, built-in habit, of creating doubt. It was built for that. It's a good thing. If the mind never created a doubt, we would be so gullible, we would never learn anything. Anybody says anything, we'll believe it. The other person will say, we'll believe that. And we might be good yes men, but we will not be making any spiritual progress. I remember a story of the Russian Tsar. The Russian Tsar uh, was entertaining the ambassador from Britain, from the United Kingdom, because there was a dispute as to who will hold Constantinople, an important port, Istanbul now in Turkey, who will hold that port because it opens a way to both Europe and Asia. So the Tsar had control over that. So he was going to give it to one of these big naval powers. So the British ambassador came and said, Your Excellency, Britain has the best navy and the Britain can really take control of Constantinople and you should give us to us the, the management of that port. The Tsar said, Yes, Mr. Ambassador, yes, Your Excellency, I certainly agree with you. Then comes the French ambassador and meets him. He's a French Navy, he's much better situated, it's closer to Istanbul, to Constantinople. You should give it to the French. He said, Yes, Your Excellency, you are right. It should be given to the French. The Tsarina, wife of the Tsar, who heard this conversation, afterwards came and said, What kind of fool are you? The British come and say, Give us the port, you say yes. And the French come and say, You give, give it and you say yes. Aren't you a fool? He said, Yes, my dear, I am. He was solving his problem by being a yes man. Now, it wasn't too bad at that time because in diplomacy, it was all right. He was even diplomat with his wife. But the point is that we can sometimes resist things to a point where we create our own problem. The mind should not be made into a yes man at all. The mind is not built to be a yes man. It is to prevent you from that situation. How does it prevent you? By creating doubt, skepticism. It makes you question, which is a good thing. The mind always starts with doubt. Of course, the consequence of the doubt can be little negative. It is fear. When you are in doubt, you can be afraid. So therefore, doubt and fear are natural traits of the functioning of the mind. We have to accept them. That's what the mind was built for. So that it should have a doubt, it should have be fear, and therefore makes us precaution, take precaution against taking undue risks and leaping into the dark. We don't want to leap into the dark. The mind is a good warning for us. It's a good system. That is why when we are trying to deal with the spiritual path, the mind also comes in and creates a doubt and says, how can I be sure? This I may be misled into something wrong. Maybe it's not a, a God speaking, a devil is speaking to me. Maybe it's the negative power trying to distract me from what I'm supposed to do. It raises these questions automatically. And according to me, it's good that it raises these questions so that you can then tackle them, get answers to them. And But if you can keep on examining continuously, even when you get the answers, just because you're being led continuously by the mind, and not asserting your will. Your will is to take advantage of the mind skepticism. Deal with the situation, learn about it, and move on. Remember, we have two wills in each one of us. The spiritual will that comes from our consciousness and soul, and the mental will that comes by thinking about things. Mind is a thinking machine. When the mind expresses a will, 
is expressed by thinking about something and saying so. The spiritual will comes intuitively. There's no thought involved. It's a gut feeling that we get this, you'll be done. This is the right thing. When the spiritual will and the mental will are in conflict, you have to decide which one should prevail. If we are never listening to the spiritual will, the mental will always prevails. And that's why we are leading a life of confusion, indecision, and constantly worrying about things because we are only being led by the mental will. We have never asserted ourselves. We have never asserted that, look, mind, you have given your opinion, you have given your skepticism, you have given your doubt. Now I have to resolve how much I can test out and find if it is true or not. I have researched and found out that this was not right. You are still keeping on giving me that advice. I ignore it. The spiritual will can do that. We don't exercise it. This is a case of intuition versus reason. A, a case of where you use your gut feeling against the feeling generated by your thoughts. There, ultimately, you should have the final say. Your intuitive will should have the final say. Your spiritual will should prevail and not the mental will. So remember this also, that the mind is doing its function. Don't be carried away with it. It's giving you a warning. It's giving you an opportunity to investigate. It's giving you an opportunity to check out. Is it right or not? Then ascertain and use your spiritual will to ignore the mental will. So this is another very important thing in a way of life. So because if we continuously live with the mental will and in doubt, how can we make any progress on the spiritual path? We are continuously in a state of doubt and confusion. What causes confusion? So many people come to me and tell me, I'm confused. I said, after meditation, you go to the stage called Par Brahm, beyond the mind, you'll never be confused again. Never. It's a mind's function to create this skepticism, create the different options, and create confusion, which is the right thing to do. And therefore, you get confused. Now, once you have the intuitive self working, your spiritual will working, you will always know what's the right thing to do. So therefore, develop that, use that more. Of course, with meditation, you can actually have an experience where you can separate yourself completely from the mind. See that the mind is a machine to help you. Mind was given as a very wonderful, effective machine to help you. But it's not yourself. It's not you. It's the mind. So you can use the mind. It's very good to use the mind, but horrible to let the mind use you. Horrible to make the mind your master. You should be the master of your mind, of your body, of your senses. You should decide how to use them. Not that these things should tell you how they should be used. So this is another tip I'm telling you, that when you have this experience of gut feeling and mental thoughts, the mind will warn you, take advantage of it. But then with your gut feeling, overrule it when necessary. Many people tell me that our mind is bothering us too much. We can't meditate, our mind is not letting us meditate. I say, why do you let mind do that? Develop your spiritual will more and more. How do we develop? He says, it's very simple. The mind tells you do something on a particular day. Say no. Mind says, there is no harm, say no. Mind says, one time only, say no. Mind says, oh, uh, we'll forget about it, say no. You know if you say no only a few times a week to the mind, it comes under control. But you have to assert it. You, you have to assert a man married a famous rider, horse rider once and he went and the, he was riding his horse and the wife, newly married wife was riding her horse and suddenly that horse of the wife jumped and she fell down. She got down and said, this is once, one time. Again, after a few rounds, the horse again jumped and she fell down two times. Third time, the horse threw her down, she took out a gun and shot the horse, killed him. The man said, how dare you do like that? You hurt this animal? She said, this is one time. 
they will live happily ever after. <laughs> this is the nature of our mind. We should tell it one time. And it comes under control. Not all the time. It's not necessary to fight the mind all the time, in meditation particularly, fighting the mind, mind is thinking of something else. No, no, come back, I want to meditate. Mind goes away, come back. And we get tired after two and a half hours of exhausting meditation. <laughs> what good is that kind of meditation which exhausts you? If you have real meditation, you'll feel so energized. You'll feel so strong, like a new person. You'll get up, wow, what a wonderful day I'm going to have. There's big difference in the two. So that is why develop your spiritual will and overcome the mental will. Make use of it as a warning mechanism, as a mechanism to tell you, please check out again. It's a good thing. Yes, check. But don't continuously live in the will of the mind. Because the mind's will will definitely take you where, where the mind has got pleasure. The mind has got pleasure from the attachments and the desires of a created physical world. There's no question about it. Therefore, mind will run outside. Every time you want to let the mind run, mind will run outside. It will never let you go inside. So take that for granted. If you're only going to be going with the mind's advice, which are thoughts, you will never be successful in meditation. Because mind will always say you can find things outside. But if you want to go to the real spiritual truth inside you, which all mystics have said, the truth is inside you, you want to go there, you must exercise your spiritual will and develop that will so that you have the ability to say no to your mind. And when you have developed that, it doesn't take too long. Once the mind knows that you are in control, it will automatically obey you. In very first instance, it will obey you. You will be so surprised how pliable the mind can become, how obedient a servant the mind can become if you exercise your spiritual will. Mind is also interested in pleasures, but there are more pleasures inside than outside. Just because it hasn't seen it, it's just attaching you to things outside. Let it have a little good time also along with you inside. <coughs> the mind will never run outside. So that is why to have effective meditation, use your mind to help you, to go with you, and to have a joint ride with you. Let the mind come with you. And that happens. The mind, they say, is our greatest enemy on the spiritual path. And once it tastes something inside, it's your greatest friend also on the spiritual path. The mind likes pleasure. Not only like, likes pleasure of all kinds, it likes a variety of pleasures. If you give it one pleasure, after some time it gets tired, wants something else. It likes a variety of pleasures. And therefore it switches from one to the other all the time. But when it gets the pleasure of variety of pleasures inside, it becomes your friend and travels with you. So remember these basic things about good meditation. It's not a ritual, not that you have to close your eyes and spend two and a half hours. I say, keep on saying, five minutes of effective meditation with love and devotion is worth more than eight hours of sitting mechanically and trying to find something. So therefore, make it effective meditation, useful with the result that you can get. Otherwise, we are making it religion. Religions tell us the same thing. People do this. They have been going to church every Sunday for mass, and now they go to satsang every Sunday for a satsang with a master. No change in their life, no progress inside, no experience inside or outside. Same fights at the house, same anger outside, same lust and greed. As ever before, what kind of benefit did you get from this kind of spiritual life? Make it such a, such a life that it shines out. People can see such a big difference in you. That what has happened? You're so calm and peaceful now. You are loving everybody and that's so detached at the same time. How can that be? But that happens just by effective meditation. So make full use of this effective meditation. Take advantage of it. I'm very happy I got the chance to spend some time with you. There are a few people who have never seen me before and have asked to meet me. I will see them now. And uh, the rest can go home now, have a peaceful journey back, and I'll see you again next month. Any of you can come back. Thank you. God bless you. Great Master bless you.